Hello, everyone online. So glad everyone is here. Um, we're going to talk about, as to open up, taking sermon challenges. Every week, I try to make sure there's something applicable that you can put into action for what we're talking about. And when you take a sermon challenge seriously, it can actually change you. Uh, I've given this challenge many times. I'll give it again today. Give God 15 minutes to interrupt you every day. Some of you do not like being interrupted. Some of you don't have that time to be interrupted. Give God 15 minutes to be interrupted. We've had, over the years, so many people in our church accept this challenge, and they come back and they tell me stories, and that just fires me up, and I just love it. We've had even people who bill hourly. That's a big, that's a big cost, right? So we've got doctors, lawyers, accountants. doesn't matter who you are, even contractors. Suddenly, God, I'm open for you interrupting me 15 minutes a day, whatever it is you want me to do, because it's your time. Isn't that interesting? It's your time, God. We know that as Christians, but often when people are kind of taking our time, they're stealing our time, they're talking too long for my time, then suddenly we feel like we're being robbed of something that isn't really ours to begin with. So I have a friend who is a doctor, still is a doctor, used to be in our church, moved to another town. Uh, but he used to tell me these stories all the time. He goes, man, uh, you would give this challenge on stage. And I'd think, I don't, I can't do that. But then I felt convicted. So I said, okay, God, I'll do it. And then I have a patient. And you know when you have that moment, when you have that person who's like, they probably need a little more. They probably need, and you're like, do I ask the question? Because if I ask, if I say, do you need to tell me more about that? You don't know when they're going to stop. You, you know what I'm talking about? You don't know how long that train's going to run. And so he says, this is this act of faith that I'm going through because I got other people that are coming in. And he says, but it's the weirdest thing. I just kept, I would, if I would notice it, I would say, God, I can't do this for every patient, but I can at least do it once a day. And so he would say, tell me more, or do you need to talk about that? And, and they would talk and they would share. And sometimes it would end in prayer, talking about faith. And they would open up that door. And suddenly he's starting to see how his work and his practice it's actually part of ministry and how it's not like you have ministry and then church and it's like, no, those are meant to be integrated into your life together. And he's sharing and he's getting excited about this. And he said, and it's the weirdest thing. Every time I was done, it was right around 15 minutes. And I started trusting God in this more and more and more. And he got really fired up. A sermon challenge, if you're responding to the word of God and putting it into action, can change your life. And I hope you can do that through this sermon series on margin. Quick review of last week. Margin is the space before your limits. Most of us run right up to our limits. Margin is reserve in your tank, meaning you don't blow everything. You actually put things away. Let's put that next slide up. Reserve in your tank. Okay? It means you have savings. It means you have emotional reserve. It means you have financial reserve. It means you have moral reserve. Margin is also the space that protects what's most important in your life. That's going to be really important when we get today, because we're talking about time today. Are you protecting your time to invest in what is most important in your life? And you know that I'm going to say God's one of those things, of course. But there's not just, you know, not just God's. What about your loved ones? What about your health? What about your rest? What about your play? Are you guarding those things? You see, for most of us, and I almost debated bringing up this really old, crusty sponge. Anyone got any of those? Some, who of you are like, I hate sponge. They're disgusting. They're like, they hold a whole bunch of microbes and everything else. But I think many of us, sorry, that might just be me. Okay, so I think many of us, we come to God totally dried up. You might be here today totally dried up, and God is here to refresh you 100%. But I want you to imagine serving God out of an overflow. See, most of us spend the whole week running dry. And we come to God empty. We're a desert. Our souls are parched. I want you to imagine serving and living and working out of overflow. I'm not saying all the time, because sometimes it's just going to be tough. But in general, living life out of overflow. This is not the way we were raised to live. We were raised to burn ourselves out. And the more we do, the better we are. I think Jesus shows a different pace. And we're going to check out his pace. And we're going to show how you kind of know Jesus was on a different pace. We're going to pray. We're going to look at Mark chapter 5. Let's do it. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning. Help us 
to walk at your speed as your followers. When you stop, help us to stop. When you run, help us to run. Lord, help us to know that we don't have to live up to anyone's measurement except yours. Help us to take home today something that can really change our lives. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 5, if you want to look at one of our Bibles in the, in the pews here, if you're online, you can go ahead and look online uh, and do that. Follow along with us. Uh, and I'll just tell you guys again, the reason we don't put all these on screen is because we think if you get your eyes on your own screen, you can take notes. It makes a big difference. Um, I'll say this as we, as we open up these verses. Giving Jesus your calendar is one of the hardest things for people to do. Not in every culture, but in our culture. It's one of the hardest things for me. I've known people who are more willing to give Jesus their pocketbook than their calendar. Because time is so important. These are very driven people, typically. Jesus moves at a different pace. What I often say to those people, and I'll say to you guys, I said it last week too, is uh, do you think you can accomplish more than Jesus did? Look back on the last three years of your life, O oh driven person. Have you started a multi-billion follower, lasted for thousands of years, organization that's transformed the face of the earth? Maybe Jesus knows something about productivity and efficiency that we don't. Okay? Things to think about. Jesus got into a boat and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. There's going to be lots of pauses in here. Jesus was in demand. Anyone know the feeling of lots of people needing your time and attention? Okay, no one. All right, let's keep going. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him, my little daughter, my little daughter is dying. Please come lay your hands on her and heal her so she can live. Jesus is full of compassion. Jesus wants to heal. So Jesus goes with them. And all the people are following, crowding around him. They're crowding around to see a little show. They're crowding around to see a miracle. It's kind of what people do. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. We know that this is menstrual bleeding. Bleeding makes you isolated from other people, considered unclean in Jewish culture. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay for them, but she would gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Very likely that this woman for 12 years has not been hugged or touched. you got to imagine the plight of this daughter of God who's feeling this anguish of, isola anguish of isolation and separation and this sense of, I'm unclean, I'm dirty. And she's longing and she's tried everything she can to be healed. And now she's going to decide to walk into this crowd. And again, to touch someone in that culture when you're unclean makes them unclean. But for Jesus, Jesus is like soap. When you touch soap, it doesn't make the soap unclean. It makes you clean. But she's taking a risk by doing this. So she tries to do it in secret. She had been heard about Jesus, verse 27, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe, for she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. That's incredible faith. Immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. And Jesus realized that once that healing power had gone out of him, so he turned in around in the crowd and said, who touched my robe? couple things real quick here. Number one, what is Jairus thinking? My daughter is dying. Why are we stopping? Who cares who touched you? Who cares who you healed? This is the only thing that matters. My daughter is dying. She's literally on death's door. Stop being interrupted. Do you know what I'm talking about here, friends? Single-minded. This is important. Here we go. And God seems to interrupt you right at those moments, doesn't he? And you're like, God, don't you know what's important? Don't you understand time? This is kind of what we do with God. Our frustrations, our hurt, our, our desperations. And if you know the story, you know Jesus is not in a rush and he's setting up a greater miracle. 
but he stopped because he's thinking about the woman who suffered for 12 years. And if she gets this miracle, this special miracle, who's going to know? How long is it going to take for her to be socially healed? How long is it going to take for her to be verified that this bleeding has stopped? She's been, she has this reputation. Jesus is going to heal her reputation. He's going to heal her more than physically. He's not doing it to out her or shame her. He's doing it to take away her shame. Jesus is interruptible. Are you interruptible? His disciples said to him, look at the crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept looking around and to see who had done it. And, this, the, this, and then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell at her knees, another person in front of him, and told him what she had done. Courage, strength. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. The whole crowd hears this. Your suffering is over. And while he was still speaking, the messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the temple, and they told him, your daughter's dead. There's no use troubling the, temp the, troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Just believe. And he did. And then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go in with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. And many of you know that they would actually hire professional weepers and wailers. And he went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. Now, Jesus isn't lying here. He is protecting the reputation of this young girl who lives in a village from a well-known official. And if she is the freak who rose from the dead, they're always going to see her only as that. He says she wasn't. They just made a mistake. She's sleeping. He's protecting her reputation. Jesus cares. He wasn't doing it for the fame. He wasn't doing it for the attention. And sometimes, so much of what we do for God we want to know, but how many people are going to recognize me for it? He does the opposite. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave. And he took the girl's father and mother and three disciples into the room. Try to imagine this. Dead girl lying down, father and mother, three disciples. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. And Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And he told them also, give her something to eat. Amen to that. I just love that. I love so practical. So practical, right? Okay. How do you react when you're interrupted? How do you react when you're interrupted? You guys, picture here of Jesus walking at a different pace than most of us. First of all, he was interrupted by the synagogue leader. Like, he doesn't go, hey, people are going to die all over the place. He was interruptible. And then he's interrupted on the way to healing. And he stops to care for people and see people. And so here's kind of this first little point. Your reactions reveal if your heart is right. Your reactions reveal if your heart is right. Some of us struggle so much with being interrupted. Some of us struggle so much with, hey, this is my time. But... We don't live into that, hey, my life has a purpose and God has got me in his hands and I can make my plans, but I live my life at the pleasure of God. And if he chooses to interrupt me, I'm okay. doesn't mean you can't have time. I've, I used to struggle a lot with this. And now what I basically do is I schedule aside non-interruptible time. I turn my email off. I turn my phone off. I can't be my whole week. But I'm tired of, I was, got tired of basically answering the phone going, what? Or thinking that in my head. Instead of going, no, there's times where I'm not interruptible, and the rest of the time I am interruptible. That's the life I want to live. I bet that's the life you want to live. Schedule a site. Don't be a victim of people taking time. Schedule out your time. Get in control. Figure out the rhythm of life that God wants you to have. Ultimately, we need to be with God so we can live into the overflow, which means you need to make margin in your life to follow Jesus first and then live out of the overflow. 
You need to actually make that margin. Because here's the thing, brothers and sisters, you will not learn how to walk at the pace of Jesus unless you walk with Jesus. You can't learn, oh man, Jesus seems to walk at a different pace. Yeah, that seems cool. I'm just over here doing my own thing though. Jesus invites us into a relationship with himself. This is different than time management. This is different than being effective and efficient. This is actually getting with the maker of the universe and going, who am I? I'm trying to live to please others, but I really need to live to please you. I'm trying to accomplish certain goals, but I really need to hear your goals for my life. That has to come first. So what if your God's goal was live at a different pace? Have three family dinners a week. What if that was God's goal and you're like, okay, I got a choice now. What am I going to do? Which pace are you going to live at? As you live into that, here's the craziest thing that happens. And you can learn it from Jesus. I've learned it in my own life. I've talked to so many people in business, in uh, in blue collar, white collar, all over the place. When you start living with God, suddenly you have boundaries. And people get upset about that. And then they respect it. And then they go, oh man, you have your life kind of figured out. You don't do everything everyone wants. And then you have a life flowing out of you. And guess what happens when you have boundaries and a life flowing out of you? People want more. And suddenly you're put into more positions of influence because you actually have a life flowing out of you, the life of Christ flowing out of you. It changes everything. And so you have to keep having these boundaries, keep having these things going on because you're living out of the overflow. This is one of the secrets of leadership, one of the secrets of using time well. It changes everything. And you stop living, being stressed out, Here's a great quote from a guy named Kerry Newhoff. People will not help you live according to your priorities. They want you to live according to their priorities. You're the only one who's going to be able to hold your priorities. So you have to be able to live that and live out of the overflow. Okay, And this comes from following him. Now, we've used this illustration. I've used this illustration many times in the past. This is my little jar with rocks in it. Does anyone know this illustration and can help me walk through the first half of this illustration together. So, are you going to come up on stage? If not, I'll do it on my own. Anyone know this one? All right, Mike's coming. Let's give Mike a hand. All right, Mike, grab that, well, empty this, grab that yellow microphone over there. Been on there. You gotta push it one more. Push it like lightly. Green. Okay. Green is good. Green's good. Okay. So, Mike, we're gonna talk about first. Wh- what is? What does this mean? Well, I think that's your life. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mike. Thanks. Meaningless, empty, <laughs> void of all purpose. Okay, the time that, the you, time that you have in your life. Okay, this, that's what this is. That's what this is. Okay, and what do the big rocks represent? Uh, the important things in your The important life. things in your life. What do the little things represent? All the extra stuff. All the extra things. Things that you're asked to do. Things might be good, but they're not the key things. You only got a few of those key things. And again, we're going to do this kind of the wrong way, the way that most of us do it. What, 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 do, what do most of us do? Most of us put all the fun stuff, all the little stuff in first. Right. And, and what are some of the reasons we put these things in first? Some are pleasurable. Some are stuff that people push upon us. Right. Some are things that our pastor tells us we have to do. You can mute the mic, right? We can, we can, we can do that, right? Uh, some of the things the world tells us are important. Uh, other people tell us that we need in our lives ahead of everything else. Yeah. Sometimes we even do this thing. C.S. Lewis talks about it. Thank you. Uh, that we're trying to live for God and for the world. We're trying to do a little bit of both. We're not saying God to give you everything. We're saying God, I want to give you kind of a little bit of you and a little bit of me, and kind of go from there. And then one ends up happening. So we got all these things in our life. This is what I have to do for work. I have to do pay my bill. I have to do have things happening. 
and I'm getting everything everyone else wants to do, all my fun stuff, and then you go, okay, so now I have these things, and what do we try to do? Try to fit them in. Okay. This seems okay. You're leaving the pizza one out. That's pizza. That's pizza. This is one of your most important things. Just saying. Okay. And does anyone know what this life feels like? You're trying to squeeze in your health. You're trying to squeeze in God. You're trying to squeeze in your loved ones. And it doesn't work very well. Let's give Mike a hand. I'm not giving you a hand. So now what I want to talk about is what are the big rocks? What are the big rocks? And how can you do what we're talking here? Take your calendar and start. This is going to be hard. Take your calendar and start with the big rocks first and then put everything else in. And I'm wondering if you can actually take this sermon challenge. Let the chips fall where they may. If you could actually say, the big rocks in my life are going to go first. I'm going to stop trying to squeeze in what's most important in my life to my life. I'm going to start by saying the first priority on my schedule is what's most important in my life. And then everything else is going to revolve around that. That's a tough one. And I'm going to say to you, it will make you more efficient, more joyful, more productive. Okay? First rock. God. That's the first rock. If you are God-fueled, living God-first, it's going to change everything. And I say God-fueled because you need the fuel of God to run your soul. Do you know what it's like to try to give love and care for people when your soul is empty? How many of you know what that is like? Come on. How many of you know how to, yeah, you're serving on the empty? Okay, It's like you're trying to drive your car and grinding the engine because the oil is gone. Right, And you're going, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. There's an old saying, change the oil or change the engine. Right? You can work on having a relationship with God who's going to fill up your life. You need to eat. How many of you eat you know, like every day? So I'll give you this. You don't have to do your devotions on the days you skip eating. If you have time to eat, do you have time to read the Bible? You can read it while you're eating. You don't have to be sitting still. You can run. You can do it in the car. You can do it in the shower. You can do it in the bathroom. Spending time with God. Basically, three ingredients are all you need. Number one is you need to have something about the Bible. You need to have a verse, passage, chapter. The Bible is how God talks to us so that you're not just following whatever God you made up in your head. You're following the God of the revealed word. Second is you need to pray. It doesn't have to be some long, crazy, nutso prayer, but it's how you're responding back to God. This is what's known as a conversation where you listen and you talk and then you respond. That's the third ingredient. You go, God, what is it you want me to do today? Good bosses are trained to have time to check in with their employees every day so they know they help their employee figure out, here's where you should be going. This is what you should be doing today. What do you think happens when employees never have time to talk to their supervisor? They start doing whatever they think is most important, i.e., this is what most Christians do. We're not having time to listen to God every day, who's our boss, and he's going, I know you got a million things going on, but this is what's most important. This is what I want you to focus on. And then we have to make a decision. Do I even want to have that conversation with my king? Are we willing to do it? Number one, put this time in your schedule. So I want you to imagine your schedule is completely open. You have 168 hours in the week. Number one, you go, when is my time with God? Nothing's on your calendar. I know it's crazy to think. Nothing's on your calendar. When's your time with God? You're here right now. Awesome. Are you in a group? Are you serving on a team? What are the things that God has asked you to have in the rhythm of your life? Start there. Start there. When is your quiet time with God? 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day. When is that? Well, I'm too busy to pray. You're too busy not to pray. If you're going to drive, you've got to get fuel. Now, I'm too busy to get gas. I'm on a road trip. I don't have time to stop for gas. 
That's what it means when we say, I don't have time for quiet time. Right? When is that time going to be in your life? When are you going to carve that in? I've known people who've done that at four in the morning or midnight or everything in between. I just want to know, are you going to live out of the overflow of a relationship with the God who stopped to heal the woman who was bleeding and the, and the girl who was dying? Because I don't know about you, but my life doesn't look as interruptible as that yet. Is yours? Yeah, no one wants to answer that one. Yeah, okay. Number two. Number two is your loved ones. Number two is your loved ones. And, and even having a little bit of fun. Okay? That's that second big rock that you have in your life. Okay? That's your loved ones. You need to schedule in time with your loved ones. Or it's not going to happen. I've seen so many people drive and drive and drive and even do sports, whether they're coaching or watching or having their kids in, and they don't have any of that time with their friends and their family and their loved ones to really fill up life to how it's supposed to be. Obviously, you could say if you're watching sports with your family, that could be part of your family time. That's great, right? But you need to be able to have that time. You need to be able to have that time to get with the people who really bring you joy in life. How many people have I talked to who said, I don't have any friends in my life? That is almost always a time issue. We don't make enough time for the people who really matter most. In my family, we just said, hey, there's two nights that will not be touched. Those are for family. We're going to sit down. We're going to be doing dinner. We limit how many times I'm out a night. Because I'm a pastor, so that means i got to be available to a certain extent for people when you're available, which is typically after work. But I also have a family, so I have a choice. Am I going to make sure I'm available enough for them? Or everyone else. I can never be available enough for everyone else. I don't know if you know this. That's partially how it's supposed to be. So you don't depend on me. You depend on Jesus and each other and other pastors. Like, that's how it's supposed to work. Okay? But I have to make sure that I say, I'm going to guard that. And I just have to tell you, if I can put up with people being disappointed, people who love me and care about me, you can too. You can guard that time. Again, so start with your calendar and go, when is my family time going to be? If you're married, when's your date night? Okay? When's your time that you're really just enjoying life? When's time that you're soaking it up? When's that time? Is it weird to hear in a sermon that God wants you to have fun with people you love? Is that weird to hear? Mm. I don't know, I'm going to try this with you guys. See, when I ask a question, I want you to actually answer it. See, I want you to try that, okay? For some of you, that's weird because God's always supposed to, you hear, you're supposed to do more, you're supposed to do more, you're supposed to do more. I'm trying to break that false image of God as this driving tyrant overlord into the image of God who's a father who wants the best thing for his children. I want you to kind of live into that image with me together. Number three is rest and refresh and self-care. A lot of people today are talking about the importance of mental health times of doing that, taking care of yourself. God knew how important this command would be for us. He actually made it one of the Ten Commandments. Honor the Sabbath. What are you supposed to be doing on the Sabbath? Resting and worshiping. Right? Be honest. How many of us say, that is number one before anything else. I have to rest and I have to worship. And the rest of my calendar is going to have to revolve around that. Is this normal in our culture? No. And, and not, we're, we're showing how much it works in our culture, right? Because we're totally healthy, full of life. We're showing that if, we, if worship is number five on the list and rest is number ten, everything will be fine. Because we're highly productive people. It makes us more productive not to rest, right? No. You got a choice. Are you going to follow kind of the normal trend of burn yourself out and we'll just move on to the next person we can burn out? Or are you going to say, I'm going to carve time to worship the Lord and it's going to fill up my tank and give me that overflow to go into the rest of the week. I'm going to be with God's people. I'm going to make sure this is part of my rhythm of life. I'm going to make sure I rest. I want you guys to try something with me. We're going to clap together. Okay, that's good, that's good. The clap part is called the beat. The opening part is called 
the rest. You cannot have rhythm without rest. This is not a beat. No one can follow this. A life with no rest is not, is not something you can follow. People will not want to imitate that. People will not want to follow you. People will not want to be imitating that. This is not rhythm. A life without rest. Cadence. Can we live in the cadence of Christ? So is it weird for you to think that what I'm saying is schedule your rest before you schedule your work? I just want to know if you'll try it. Because I think a lot of people in this room are going, no. No, I won't even try it. You don't understand, Scott. And we could sit down and go, who's got a worse job? Who has more people demanding their attention and time? You only work one day a week, Scott. Of course you think you can do that. Right? I just want to know if you'll try it. I want you to clear your calendar. Maybe you have to start in a month. But even Mark Twain said, it's not that the Bible is too hard to understand. It's the parts of the Bible that I do understand that I don't want to do. What if we just said, hey, I'm going to start with scheduling in rest, the commandment of God. I'm going to start with scheduling in my loved ones. I'm going to start with my time with God. And then I'm going to have everything else revolve around that. I'm going to make sure those are scheduled the first. Before I say yes to everything else, I'm going to learn how to say no because the time is taken. I don't know. What do you think? I think if you do that, you'll start to realize you're going to have to come up with a plan. And that's what I'm really challenging you to do. You see, we have 168 hours in the week. Go ahead and put that up. Okay? About a third of our time is discretionary time. We have about 60 hours a week, depending on how much you sleep, on sleep and hygiene. You have 40 to 60 hours, depending on how much you work, on work and school. Okay? The remaining time is 50 to 60 hours in your life. So the question is, what are you doing with that time? What are you doing with that time? 50, 60 hours a week, a third of your time is considered discretionary. This is where most of us have to figure out, what are we doing at that time? Are we going to have God time in there? Is that going to happen or not? Are we going to have time for ministry, time to make a difference together or not? I just keep dropping those rocks. And you'll find that if you get the first things in first, there is room for everything that's made to fit. I think sometimes a good analogy would be for this, if all the small rocks didn't fit, so that we'd be okay saying, hey, maybe we can't fit everything into our lives, and that would be okay. Come up with a plan. The Bible says, Psalm 90, 12, teach us to measure our days. Are you even aware of how you're spending that 50 to 60 hours a week of your discretionary time? The average American spends 28 hours a week on a screen. That equals 10 years of your life. I'm not talking about your computer screen. I'm talking about entertainment parts of things. So with that 50, 60 hours a week, the average American spends half of it in entertainment. I think entertainment's great. I don't know if it's worth half of your free time per week. That's 10 years of your life over time. How do you live into these big rocks first and say, I really want to live that good life, that overflow life. Uh, we talked last week about maybe it's time for an entertainment detox or a digital detox. I'm just saying, God, I just need to clear that. I've had people say to me, I don't watch any TV. I don't do any of that stuff. And my question always back is, then what are you doing with that time? Everyone has something that they're doing. And don't miss my point. Some of the time is supposed to be for fun. And if entertainment or video games is fun, then do that. That is supposed to be what that's for. But you at least need to be aware of it 
If I were to go around this room and ask you guys, how many of you know exactly what you're doing with your free time if I go through the week, most of you would be shocked at what you're actually spending your time on. We're not even aware. Here's the cycle, friend. We're burned out from overworking, so then we overrest and we overplay and we don't pay attention to what we're really doing with that time because we're dry sponge, right? And we're just like, Ugh. and those things don't really fill us up because they're not the real fuel of life. They're not the real like doing life with God in community, making a difference with our life. Things that really fill us up and give us purpose that then drive us back into work going, I can't wait because now my work is ministry and my life has purpose. I understand what life's all about. I know how to go to bed. I know how to sleep. I know how to set limits on my time. I know how to do those things. And then we're fired up for what the next day and the next week and the next month are going to bring. Instead, we're always living on empty. What if you turned it around? And I have to say to you, as your pastor, as your friend, as your brother in Christ, this is a conversation I'm having with so many of you. When you're coming in and talking to me going, I am empty. Think about your time. Maybe think about taking the challenge. Because here's what I found. Every time our church talks about margin, I have people come and tell me, I know that God wants me to have more margin in my life. And I go, man, I'm so happy to hear that. And they go, so I'm going to step down of ministry team. I'm going to stop going to life group. I'm going to, because that's the only thing I got to, and I go, okay, so what you're telling me is one hour a week is going to solve all of your margin issues. That time where you're with other people in God's word, serving in the community, having people support you, that's the hour that's going to change your life and give you, no, I can't do that, but I overcommitted everywhere else. And I can't say no to them. I can say no to God and church because I know God and church will always love me and always be there for me. And my answer back is he absolutely will. God absolutely will. But can you drive without fuel? My friends, week two of margin is about schedule. And it's about putting first things first in your life so that you live out of the overflow. Can you just imagine your life in overflow? Can you imagine your life in overflow? Can you imagine what Monday morning would look like if you were in overflow? I don't know if you know this, most of us are so empty, we're trying to get other people to fill us up. So how do I know you had a bad day? Because the people at work, oh my gosh. What if you were so full of Christ that the people at work, they affect you because you care about them, but they're not going to determine if you had a good day or not. Or the customers. Or the people at school. What if you said, no, I'm coming in with peace. I'm not looking for peace from others. They ain't got it. I'm coming in with the peace of Christ that transcend all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Wouldn't that be different? Now imagine being a room of people who had the peace of Christ, who had the love of Christ, who didn't say, it depends on the song if I'm going to sing it. Who said, I got the love of Christ overflowing in my life. I'm going to sing it no matter how tone deaf I am. I am. right? I'm going to dance because I'm a child of God. I'm in because I love Jesus. What would it look like if you said, hey, my life is in the overflow? Not all the time. Sometimes we will be empty. But in general, living in that overflow. What if we took our devotional booklets that we have today? What if we said we're coming to fight hunger next week? What if we said, God, it's all yours? What if we said we have evangelism tools? I'm going to take a card. I'm going to take a bracelet, not because we want you to wear a bracelet, because we want you to look and pray about it, because most of us just don't pray about the mission of God. God, I live on your mission. This is just a reminder when you look down and go, oh yeah, I should, oh yeah, I should be praying. Oh yeah, I'm at work. I have a purpose. Oh yeah, I'm at school. I should be inviting. Oh yeah, I'm part of the big design of God calling a rebellious world back home. Yes, I'm in. Let's do it. My time is yours to take those things. This last week, our staff sat in our staff meeting, and we just started sharing evangelism stories. We've had times where we've had none. Hey, what do you guys have? Nothing. Okay, but this week was awesome. Gotten family members, people going for walks in their neighborhoods and running into people accidentally, right? 
you know, because God sets up these appointments and things are happening. I show up for youth group to pick up my kids and suddenly there's a parent I haven't seen in a while. I don't even say anything. He goes, I know, I need to be back at church. And I'm like, that's so great. It'd be great to see you. Was it, should I have stayed in my car? Or maybe God has a purpose for my time getting out of the car. Maybe all of us are part of this bigger plan of God and our time is part of it. So let's pray. And I want you just to have a minute with God and just say, God, my time is yours. And maybe today, your commitment to God is giving him 15 minutes a day to be interrupted. Maybe your commitment is to say, God, I need to be consistent in rest and worship. Or maybe you're going to take that big commitment and clear your schedule and say, God, big rocks first. I need to get my rocks right. Lord, you made time. And in all of these things, you will always love us. You will always forgive us. You will always be there for us. But there's just a way that life works. Help us to live out of the overflow. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.